Connect system. Uh, and as course, Penn State's World Campus program continued to grow. So we've kept in touch. And it's really a pleasure to invite Ed here today to share with you uh, some of his background work in uh, his company. He's the CEO of a company called UCompass. They have a product called Educator that is their learning management system. Ed will give you more background on that. But this is, uh, this is really the topic for today in a sense. A uh, part of Ed's passion is uh, STEM education and in particular meteorology. And Ed's been doing some really cool work with a project he has called Weather STEM. And, uh, and Ed and his colleague Julie Davis have joined us from Florida. Uh, this afternoon, they're going to share a little bit of their work with us. So um, let me see if there's anything I missed there. Nope. So Ed, you're on. Thank you. Thank well, you. Welcome back to uh, to Penn State. It's a pleasure thank to have you. you with us. It's a pleasure to be back. My pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk to you about this project that we've launched over the last year that's gaining quite a bit of momentum. And uh, it's called Weather STEM. And as, uh, it's described as a platform for teaching science with live data. And I'm going to just sort of jump in and ask a very simple question that I've been asking people, which is, if you were watching an athletic event, uh, let's suppose it was a Penn State football game, uh, would you rather watch a live game being played in real time, or would you rather watch one on TV, maybe that's been recorded several years ago? A live one, right? So one of the premises of WeatherStem is to emulate that concept, that common sense concept, in a context of STEM education. Uh, so WeatherStem, as you'll learn, is all about bringing live data from the real world around us, captured through weather instruments like those I'm going to introduce you today, cloud cameras, uh, probes that measure things like soil moisture and soil temperature, bringing them into the classroom and helping enhance the curricular discussions that teachers are able to have with students about you know, what otherwise might be considered at first glance less interesting topics. Right? Um, so I'm going to jump in and first sort of um, talk about, um, well, let's see. Uh, so STEM, of course, as you know, is an acronym that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. As you'll learn today as we talk about weather STEM, um, in addition to weather and climate being an area of special interest to us, agriculture is also something that's very important. So the, the word STEM and weather STEM actually has dual meanings. It refers to science, technology, engineering, and math, and also STEM, like the stem of a plant. And I know that this uh, broadcast is, um, is, this is being broadcasted, and I know some of my friends in Tallahassee uh, said that they were going to tune in. So uh, hi, everyone in Tallahassee. Um, this, uh, I'll just introduce you to this unit that we've set up. This is actually broadcasting live on the internet. So if you wanted to check the weather conditions from this room, if you went to psu.weatherstem.com slash coil, you would see a live image from this camera and the live readings from these instruments. Right? And I'll, I'll bring, as I move through my lecture today, at some point I'll jump out of my PowerPoint and onto the, um, the internet, and I'll bring that up. But I just wanted to sort of share that this, has, this presentation has two live components, my video feed and the live data that we're broadcasting from these instruments here on the uh, presentation stage. Um, OK, so I want to set the uh, tone for the um, uh, weather stem platform. It is a integration of scientific equipment, like we see here, um, curriculum, which of course refers to lessons, assessments, activities, and data. Um, so you'll see the WeatherStem platform takes those three things, blends them together in a way that's positioned to really hopefully excite and engage teachers and students. I'm going to structure my presentation into six components. Um, first, I'm going to give you a little bit about my background, our company's background and history. And I'm going to sort of tell you the story about how WeatherStem came to be. COIL, of course, is the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. And for the past 15 years of my career, um, I've ran an e-learning software company. And uh, innovation was something that we had to do for survival um, if we wanted to find ways to support and retain the customer. 
to deliver something to the customer in the context of an increasingly competitive landscape. So uh, I'm going to sort of share with you a couple of the um, stories that taught us some experiences that we used in creating WeatherStem that focus on COIL's mission, which is innovation and learning. Okay? I'm going to, you know, as I said, I'm going to give you a, few, a couple of quick case studies. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about how we came up with the idea for WeatherStem. Most importantly, I'm going to focus on the weather stem demonstration so that you can see some of the things that we're doing, and you'll hopefully come to the same conclusion we've come to, that this is a platform that is really positioned to do some cool and interesting things in the name of engaging uh, students in STEM activities. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the vision for weather stem and where we're going over the next year, and it would be great if there was ever an opportunity to come back and revisit, and hopefully we'll have accomplished that vision. And you know, it, weather stem will be a, a completely new animal. And then I'm going to wrap up with your questions and my answers to those questions. Okay? Um, so uh, just, uh, you know, going into the background and history, I want to talk a little bit about my personal background. Okay, so um, I wanted to be a meteorologist from the time I was six years old. Uh, I grew up in upstate New York in the snow belt. And this scene that you see on screen here is uh, very typical of what I would see uh, during my childhood, uh, from any time from November to April. So I, I really just, you know, the, the power of nature and the power of, you know, how you could have a bright sunny day and the next morning you wake up to this really fascinated me and set me on a very strict and unwavering trajectory to becoming a meteorologist. And in fact, um, Penn State University, as many people know, the statistic that I often quote is that one out of four meteorologists in the United States are Penn State graduates. Uh, and I grew up about a two and a half hour drive from the Penn State campus. So it was very commonsensical that I would come and study meteorology at Penn State. So uh, I earned a two bachelor's degrees uh, in the scope of uh, four and a half years. I, I was in the inaugural class of the what had been the newly established geoenvironmental engineering um, bachelor's program. Um, so my, my thoughts were, from a career perspective, is that I would blend meteorology and environmental engineering in such a way that I would understand, well, how does pollution form in a factory and what happens to it when it gets dispatched out into the atmosphere. And also, uh, for my first couple years at Penn State, I played uh, attack on the uh, men's varsity lacrosse team. And um, I, when I, you know, I, I find that some of those competitive instincts from the lacrosse field I've been able to recycle and bring into my entrepreneurial activities. Uh, another thing is I'm going to just tell you that so, some people say that I had been around Penn State so long that I wrote the book on this place. Okay? Well, anyone who says that kind of is right. Because um, my first entrepreneurial activity at Penn State University was actually at Penn State University, and it was a publication called the Penn State Compass. Okay? And I'm holding up one of these publications. So um, just a quick story. Um, Near the last semester of my senior, my, my last semester at Penn State, um, my senior year, I was talking with a friend and his younger sister, and she was asking me questions about what major to choose, and I was giving her all this advice, and my friend said, geez, Ed, you should write a book about this place. So I actually came up with the idea for this book called The Penn State Compass, which walks you through applying to Penn State, choosing a major, um, continuing graduating, continuing on to graduate school, and getting a job. And uh, sold these books through the Penn State Bookstore's freshman orientation program. Right? And um, so it was written during my last semester at Penn State, used in the Penn State Campus Bookstore's freshman orientation program, led to our company name, which is U Compass. Okay? And the U actually stands for university, because when we started our business, we envisioned most of our efforts would be directed toward higher education. So um, quite literally, uh, Penn, you know, our company started at Penn State University. Um, so then, um, just fast forwarding, um, I decided to continue my education and enrolled in the Florida State University's Department of Meteorology. And my focus area there, I, I earned a master's degree in meteorology at Florida State. And my research area was in a project called TRIM, which is the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission. Now. Um, 90% of the Earth's rain falls in the tropics, but less than 1% of the Earth's rain measuring equipment, such as this, is in the tropics. And it turns out that 
rainfall is a very, the formation of rainfall is an extremely important process in driving global climate circulation because liquid, water vapor goes from the gas phase to the liquid phase and releases heat, latent heat of vaporization, and that heat drives a lot of our global climate circulation, all right? So it's important to know where that rain is falling, and the solution is is put a satellite up in space to measure it. So I was a scientist on that project, and it turns out uh, that I was, uh, sort of reverse order of my slides, I, I became somewhat of a Perl junkie, okay? Now, how many have heard of Perl? Perl is a programming language, and I found that for the type of work I was doing on that trim project, which was pulling large, large amounts of data from the satellite feed, what I could do in about 1,000 lines of Fortran, or not at all, I could do in maybe 50, 70 lines of C, and what I could do in 50 or 70 lines of C, I could do in maybe 10 lines of Perl. So I became fast friends with Perl very quickly, and it turns out at that time, a lot of the glue of the early web was being written in Perl. Okay, so it was sort of some interesting timing. And then at Florida State, um, the head of the meteorology department asked if any of the graduate students were interested in teaching meteorology, um, which I had not come to Florida State with an ambitious, uh, ambition of doing. So uh, I looked around, and no one was raising their hand. So I said, well, I'll try it. So um, I was thrown into a class of about 180 students teaching a three-credit meteorology course, and I didn't have any teaching experience. So, and I wasn't making a lot of money, to, to say the least. So um, I blended these experiences I was getting, writing code, internet-based code, and I put my course online. And this ugly thing that you're going to see here, this is actually from the Wayback Machine. This was the first online course that I ever built. Okay? And that was built during the fall semester of 1997. And I would just tell my students, okay, we're taking a quiz. Go to this web page to take it. Okay? And I was developing stuff that would automatically grade it, keep track of the grades. Um, I had things like um, question and answers. On Tuesday nights, I had like weather live online where I built a chat room. So at this point, I still hadn't precipitated the notion of turning this into any sort of entrepreneurial venture. I was just trying to make my life easier so I had more time to do what I thought I really wanted to be doing, which was the research side of things. So at some point in time, um, you know, just fast forwarding, um, a lot of people were coming and asking me, well, how are you putting your course online? Why do all these kids want to take your course? What, what, what is it all about this? I sort of, you know, came up with the idea that I seem to be pretty good at this. Um, I seem to enjoy it maybe more than my research. So sometime in 1998, I got this crazy idea that I would take those scripts and tools that I had sort of cobbled together of my own accord and put them into a system that anyone could use to teach. And that became a program that I named Educator and packaged. And since I had already created a website, ucompass.com, from that book project I told you that I started at Penn State, um, I started marketing it under the name of this company, Ucompass. And since that time, for the last 15 years, I've been engaged with a team of people to continue to enhance that program. And it served over 3 million students in K-12 and higher education in the last 15 years. Um, so that's just a little bit of a background as to how I got into um, online education software. And um, uh, that sort of sets the pace for what WeatherSTEM is, which is an, an intersection between that career that I've had in developing online education software and what I had shared with you before was a passion for weather and meteorology. Right? So um, as I said, since, we're, since I'm talking to you um, in a presentation at COIL, the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. Before I jump deep into the weather stem, uh, I wanted to focus on uh, some of the things that we've done that I'm pretty proud of that required us to be somewhat innovative in the landscape of online learning. So this platform here, does anyone remember the Palm? Okay. So this is a screen capture of the world's first internet connected handheld, the Palm 7. And the way that worked is you could buy a subscription to the Palm Network, which was ran off of Bell South, and you could connect your Palm to the internet. Okay? So um, our company, we got out of the gate pretty, pretty quickly with Ucompass. We started signing up a bunch of customers for that educator program, and I didn't really know what I was doing from a human resources point of view. So it was basically one and a half people supporting it, me and a part-time technician. So as soon as I heard about this technology that was coming out, 
I immediately jumped all over it and said we could build a platform that could enable us to support our customers without being handcuffed to our PCs or desktops. So we were so successful at doing that, we said, well, let's put the whole platform onto the wireless handheld. So we were really the first um, company, to my knowledge, that had ever, you know, integrated handhelds into the mobile landscape, into the digital learning and teaching landscape. It was sort of what I would have called maybe a solution looking for a problem. Um, and then we um, added push notifications to our system in 2001. We incorporated podcasting. Um, we were the, I actually have a video somewhere that shows, uh, I, I paid some kid a couple hundred bucks to wait outside the AT&T store in Tallahassee so I could be the first one to have an iPhone. And then we immediately integrated into our platform. And then responsive design is something we started implementing into our platform about five years ago where the aspect ratios of the browser change and the viewport is automatically resized. Right? Um, so um, then um, this is sort of an initiative. Uh, you, you'll see some bits and pieces of this when we get into WeatherStem. We had come up with this platform. This, this is sort of a story. I'll tell you a little story here. This is a technology we built called Digital Data Maps. And what it is is we can take data that has any sort of a geographic key. So a zip code, a um, area code, a phone number, and we can take that data and put it onto a map for what we call geospatial magnitude representation. All right? So um, one of our key partners in uh, our, our business is a group called the Florida Virtual School. They're the largest public online high school in, in the country, to my knowledge. And um, about 10 years ago, in 2004, um, Florida, the state of Florida was hit by four hurricanes in one year. And in some of the counties where hurricanes hit, the school buildings were actually decimated. So what we were tasked with doing was to try to help the legislature that, of course, funds this organization understand the value of this digital statewide education initiative. So what we did was is we took data that basically showed how in some of these counties where hurricanes had hit and schools were closed and in some cases destroyed, there was real learning and teaching taking place via the Florida Virtual School. And we used this digital data maps technology that's found its way into WeatherStem to create a presentation that found its way up into the high ranks of like the gover governor's office. Right? So again, this is sort of, you know, for us, we have been innovating in online learning, and for us, it's many times it's been about survival, about finding ways to, to you know, do things to better serve the customer, um, to, you know, solve a problem internally. Okay, now, um, next, uh, I'm going to talk about another thing that sort of sets the stage for what we're going to learn about WeatherStem. Th this was a quote from our company about five, six years ago, that innovation in education is now more about assimilation than invention. So, in other words, um, at the dawn of the online learning era, there was so much new to create. You know, LMS, there were so much features and functions that had yet to be created in LMS platforms and CMS platforms. Um, and, you know, over the course of, you know, as the playing field has become more and more level and anyone with $10 a month can get a cloud-based infrastructure behind them, um, you know, every, a, a lot has been invented, and now the opportunity is about how can you take all these disaggregated resources and assimilate them into one seamless experience. And that's really what we, you know, have recognized that there's a lot of skill and precision involved in doing that. And you'll see a lot of that's what our focus about WeatherStem is, is how can you bring all these different things together into one seamless experience, right? Um, so we, ca we came up with this project project, we call it a project, called Octane, about, um, and I'm just going to touch on this briefly, about three years ago. And uh, basically, I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on it, because you're actually going to see a little bit of a demo of it, because it's built into WeatherStem. But essentially, what it does is it um, sort of reverses the paradigm that you're used to with learning management systems and content management systems. In the normal LMS paradigm, you take the content and you put it into the LMS. In Octane, it's sort of the opposite of that. You start with the content and you embed the functionality into it. Right? So like I said, that, that sort of um, gets off onto a little bit more of a tangent than I'm going to subject you to now, but um, I'll just a little bit of the implementation details of it. So you take one line of text, put it in some content, and then on the right you have a list of tools. 
and then you can specify how those tools should be activated in your content based on things like cookies, metadata, LTI roles, and LTI is an IMS specification that stands for the Learning Tools Interoperability Framework, um, geolocations. Um, so uh, it's basically like a platform for deciding under what circumstances certain pieces of functionality should be activated or inactivated. And again, like I said, we'll see a little bit of that in the context of the WeatherSim platform uh, to come in a few minutes. All right. So now I'm going to move on. So um, this, you know, this is sort of a, a pause, if you will. Uh, so I, I sort of set the stage for how I got into developing online education software. Now I'm going to sort of, you know, get out on the highway and start accelerating a little bit more in the weather stem direction, you know, going back. So if you've tuned in for, to hear about weather stem and meteorology, this is where I'm going to get to the good stuff, right? So um, for the last probably 12 years, one of my hobbies has been building and managing my own backyard weather station. Okay, so I have a system like this in my backyard, and this is a screen capture that was taken, uh, I guess, a couple days ago as I was preparing this presentation. So um, I, I measure a lot of different things. Um, I have my hot tub temperature, my pool temperature. I have solar panels on my roof, and I'm actually showing in real time how much money those solar panels have generated since the sun came up. Um, I have moisture sensors that are detecting how moist or dry my soil is and are activating my sprinklers accordingly. So I, I've been, you know, I have solar radiation sensors. So the knowledge that I gained to build this weather stem project didn't come overnight. I've been quote unquote playing with these sorts of technologies for a good dozen years, all right, and, and have had you know many spousal disagreements, especially when I've tied the data into our home cooling and heating system. Okay, so um, I, I won't uh, I won't elaborate on that too much, but I'll just take for granted that this uh, you know a, a lot of experimentation came and learning really how these systems work, right? Um, then. Is, okay, now another story. I, I like to try to set up all this with stories because, uh, you know, ultimately a lot of stories have come together to contribute to how uh, this all came to be. So um, I live about a half a mile away from where my son, well, all three of my children now, go to elementary school. So I walk them to school every morning, very proudly. And um, uh, I constantly was finding myself in a pattern we're just rushing out the door and not knowing how to dress them. I would sometimes dress them too warm, too not, wouldn't dress them warm enough, uh, wouldn't bring an umbrella. And I'm thinking to myself, geez, if people knew that this poor guy, that's, or this, these poor kids with this guy that are soaking wet, the guy has a weather station in his backyard and a master's degree in meteorology, you know, they, they'd think I was an, I was an idiot. So um, I actually wrote a program to send me a text message every morning that tells me what's the temperature, what's the high going to be, and is it going to rain? So my instant, first thing I would do, I would go grab the phone and go into the closet to pick the kids' clothes out. And it was like, wow, this is really useful. So I took that same concept and um, put it on to Twitter, okay, so that that same in information would update a Twitter page. And people started following it. Then I put that same information on a Facebook page. And then within a couple of weeks, I had hundreds of people following it. And I looked into it, and most of those people were like very concentrated around the school and the neighborhood where I live. And then, uh, so like I said, the first week, I had over 200 people liking that page. And, and this sort of led to the idea, some of the ideas for weather stem, that you know, how can I maybe take advantage of the fact that People really like localized weather information. We're doing something in the, in the context of online education. There's got to be a way to assimilate all this into something useful and creative. Okay? So that's exactly what we did. And um, so that, that's an example of the uh, actual screen capture from the Twitter page. So in addition to sending that good morning update, every night at midnight it posts, well, what was the high, what was the low, how long did it rain, and how much total rain fell. Because um, as, as Larry, who has a, ha, I learned uh, last night as a master gardener, can attest, if, if you hear on the TV that we had an inch of rain, well, that doesn't necessarily mean it was at your house. So, you know, really localized rainfall can be really useful. And this page gets updated when something interesting starts, you know, like if it starts raining or if there's a heavy thunderstorm. 
And then this is a screen capture of that same weather station's Facebook page, and that rectangle got offset. But as you can see, there's 792 people that like that weather station on Facebook. So then we have a partnership. Uh, Tallahassee is in a county called Leon County. And um, the Leon County, in Florida, it's not like Pennsylvania where you have every township has its own school district. In Florida, uh, and many counties, many states in the South, like Georgia's like this, each county is its own school district. So there's some counties in Florida, like Miami-Dade, that have hundreds of thousands of students. Well, um, Leon County in Tallahassee is a fantastic school district. Very innovative um, staff and superintendent and assistant superintendent. So um, I went to the, um, uh, the administration and said, hey, you know, I've got this idea. We propose to set up weather stations like this across the school district and tie the data together in a STEM-specific context. And they were very receptive, and they took a chance and let us start going and installing these things on school buildings, on school grounds, and enabled us to sort of have a vehicle to create the platform that I'm going to demonstrate to you today, weather stem, right? And uh, we're in the process of, uh, we, we just, to tell you how fast we're moving, we had just pitched this idea to them last August or September, and we just started installing, and Ms. Julie Davis is our weather station installer and technician, we just started installing them late in October. Okay, so we've already got them all installed all across the district, and we're going to be working with their teachers, you know, teaching them how to use this technology in a professional development context, all right? So um, now um, I'm going to sort of, before I get into the demo, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the technical implementation details about how Weather STEM works. Um, so again, as you could see from that previous graphic, um, what we do is, um, for now, we've been sort of focusing on district implementations, where we'll come in and set up a sort of a micro network of weather stations across a school district. And um, so this is an example, a hypothetical school district with three schools. So each school has one of these, what we call weather stem units, all right? And I'm going to introduce you to the parts and pieces of this, all right? So um, this is called the ISS, the Integrated Sensor Suite. And this is the agricultural unit that measures soil moisture, soil temperature. And you can see there's antennas on here. And they broadcast their data wirelessly via a solar charged three volt battery to this digital console, okay? And this digital console has a ethernet connector attached to it, okay? So um, basically what, ha what then happens is that console has some software built into it that lets us push the data up to us in one minute intervals, all right? Meanwhile, we also equip a cloud camera, all right? So this little device here that we'll see the image of soon is a cloud camera that every minute when a weather record gets uploaded to us, it takes a picture of the sky overhead and ties together that weather record with what did the skies look like overhead. And that data gets pushed up to us at WeatherStem. Then we warehouse that data in our data warehouse and that drives some of the things that we're going to be looking at in the WeatherStem platform. Also, another thing that we've started, we've introduced, this is brand new, hot off the press. Um, we've uh, obtained these new sensors from Europe that have carbon dioxide, noise sensors, and we've just literally, within the past couple days, have integrated them into the WeatherStem platform, and I'm going to show you a little bit of a demo of them as well. Um, so anyway, if you look at the schematic diagram here, um, have you, I, I don't have one of the devices with me, but who's heard of the Raspberry Pi? Okay. Oh, excellent. So the Raspberry Pi is like a credit card size computer. Runs a Linux operating system. And what we do is we put, because you know, all these school districts, of course, they have very strict security protocols, as they should. So what we do is we put a ra single Raspberry Pi somewhere on the school's network. And that has software built in that is constantly connecting to these devices, gathering the data, and pushing it up to us. So in that, we don't need to ask the school district to make any firewall changes. We can basically just sit that, set that little $25 computer somewhere in their network, and it has the permission to talk to our devices and push the data up to us. So um, we, we felt that was a very important thing if this was going to become a scalable and practical initiative. So that's, like I said, a little bit of the schematic as to how 
weather stem uh, works from an implementation perspective. And now we will do this. Oh, okay. I, th this, these were just some photos. Okay, before I get into the weather stem demonstration, I'm going to show you some interesting photography. So this is actually an example of a weather stem unit that is at, at one of our schools. Um, this is DeSoto Trail Elementary School in Tallahassee. And what was very interesting is when we worked with some of these principals, um, they would make the comment, well, you know, if this is all about engaging students, I want the students to be able to see these devices. I want them to be able to interact with them. So um, I said, well, you know, we're not landing planes, so let's find a way to put them down at ground level. Obviously, we would get more reliable wind readings if they were elevated, but, you know, what we sacrifice in accuracy of some of those variables, you know, we let students actually see the data that they're going to be interacting with inside the classroom, all right? So in some cases, you know, you can see that we will coordinate the erection of a safety fence so that, you know, it, it maybe kind of can help create more of a boundary and a barrier. Um, then we have, th this is actually um, a junior high, uh, a middle school in Tallahassee where they have a very ambitious gardening and nursery program where we're measuring using sensors such as these. This is a soil moisture sensor, all right, which is buried into the soil. You can bury these at different depths and it detects how moist or dry the soil is. We have soil temperature probes that will be buried in the soil and will measure, you know, what the temperature of the soil is. Um, that's a picture of a cloud camera installed on one of the schools, and that's the digital console. There are a few other photos here. Um, there's the, uh, the ISS unit, and this um, crown that we call it, anyone want to guess what this is for? That's right, yep. It, it uh, inhibits birds from um, clogging up the rain gauge, and uh, that, that's one of the biggest, one of the only maintenance headaches of these systems is keeping the rain collectors free of debris. Um, the other thing you have to deal with, especially in the south, is pollen. Okay, you know, we had a, quite a bit of a challenge uh, back in April. It's the anemometer and wind vane, which measure wind speed and uh, direction. Um, the standard units that we install have a solar radiation sensor, an ultraviolet radiation sensor. Um, there's a close-up of the soil moisture sensor. That is a sensor that measures dew, the, the condensation of dew, which is a very important part of agriculture. This is the, um, the weather station. If, if I was to take this bucket off, this is what you would see. So within it, that's how we measure rainfall. There is a, a, a seesaw device that is calibrated to exactly one one-hundredth of an inch of precipitation. And every time it tips, it's digitally registering a signature that is calculated and computed and transmitted. That's how we keep track of not only how much rain has fallen, but how hard is it raining, okay? Um, so, sorry about that. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the uh, demonstration part of the WeatherStem platform. So I'm going to be leaving the PowerPoint and going into the web browser. So uh, hopefully this will be a smooth and seamless transition. And we're, we're going to just sort of go on a little bit of a tour of some of these um, features and functions. All right. So first, um, and I am using a PC. Those who know me well know that that is Always an adventure. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to psu.weatherstem.com slash coil. Okay, so this is live, live site. Okay, so that picture is actually a live picture from right now here in our um, paternal library. And you can see the last time a record was received was about 52 seconds ago. And those are actual conditions, right? And that's the actual picture from our cloud camera. And the reason why there's a moon here is because the image that shows up there is dynamically generated from the instrument settings. So right now, uh, there's no solar radiation in here, hopefully. So um, that's why there's a moon showing instead of, instead of the sun. All right, so um, now um, 
We can also, uh, you know, see what the 10-day forecast is. And, and this is what, what happens is, is the system is GPS aware. So all the data that we see will be specific to where we actually are right now. So this is actually the, uh, the forecast for the next 10 days for the um, state college area. And if I click on a day, down below it will actually break it down to the nearest hour. Okay? Um, so, and actually just some, uh, not to um, uh, give away, to, you know, give away the surprise, but it turns out that when Ms. Davis and I leave, we're actually leaving this unit behind and WeatherStem is donating a full WeatherStem unit to Penn State University and we're actually hoping to install it at the newly opened uh, children's garden at the Penn State Ar Arboretum. Okay? Um, so uh, anyway, th those at home or, or those watching remotely, uh, you could actually not only follow along with the video feed, but you can actually see the weather conditions as they evolve. And one of the things that I was going to do, I'll just share with you, and I didn't have time to pull it off, is I was actually going to attach this external temperature sensor to my person. And then you'd be able to see in real time how, how much anxiety maybe I was feeling as I was getting in front of talking to all you folks. But I, I sort of backed, backed away from that. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just rearrange some of these uh, wires here. And because um, in order to set all this up, I had to you know, set up a router and uh, a couple other things. So let me just get some of this out of the way. And um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to that leonschools.weatherstem.com site. And um, so when I go here, the system has GPS awareness built into it. So, and by the way, all these sites I go to, ev everything that we look at today is live. Okay, there's, there's nothing, you know, everyone can access it. I'm actually logged in as an administrator, so there's going to be certain administrative things that I, I show you. But everything else, you know, everyone can look at this, play with this, have hands-on experience with this. So when I go to the site, it automatically detects where I am. And it shows me, so this, this is for Leon County, Florida. It automatically shows me how far away I am right now from all these different schools. And it orders them from what's the closest school to what's the furthest one away from me. And uh, as you would suspect, Deer Lake Middle School is in the top of Leon County. So that's way up at the top. So each one of these icons on the map represent a school across this county where we have installed a weather stem unit. And as I move my mouse over this list, you'll see that the icons bounce. All right? So if I click on one of these sites, it will show me the current weather conditions as they're being read in real time from this device. And that is the latest cloud camera picture from overhead on top of that school. Okay? And I can click on it for a little bit more of a uh, detailed view. Now, um, some of the schools, like for instance Lincoln, not all these schools have, for the first phase of this, we didn't put uh, cloud cameras at every one of the schools. Um, and if the school does not have a cloud camera, um, it will automatically, um, so if I go to Child's High School, uh, their weather station page will have a picture and it will figure out, well, this is not my cloud camera, but this is, this is the cloud camera from the closest school and it'll tell you how far away it is. So going back to that map, what I call that map location, um, if I click on this Lincoln High School, you'll see here there's some pretty interesting things going on. They have a greenhouse where we have probes that are measuring the humidity and temperature. They have a vegetable garden where we're measuring the soil moisture at two different depths and the soil temperature at two different depths. And that's a little bit of a conversation there. Well, why is the temperature higher at six inches versus one foot? Well, of course, we can get into thermal absorptivity and heat transfer and um, thermal conductivity and, and, you know, a host of things that any, cre you know, a creative teacher could, could lead. Same with soil moisture. You get into permeability, porosity, um, all those different things, okay? Um, so then we can also zoom in, okay? So when we click zoom in, this will give us a close-up of the school grounds, all right? And we can actually, if I switch over to satellite view, this lets us see where on the school grounds these different units are, these different sensors are, okay? So this is Lincoln High School, which is one of the bigger high schools in the region. And wherever you see one of these little icons, that's where one of the transmitters is. That's where there's this, a device that's transmitting data. And if we click on one of those transmitters, we'll see um, what the 
all the instruments attached to it, all the sensors. And remember I talked about Octane before, which was like adding functionality to web content? This actually is a little bit of an example of it because we have this Octane tool that looks for science relevant words, okay? And when it finds them, it turns them into hyperlinks that when you click on, it'll give you more expansion and more definition about them. As we go forward with WeatherStem, those will be, you know, videos, simulations, other sorts of things, all right? Absolutely, yeah, please, interrupt me anytime. Oh, I close that out there. Um, where you were showing the sensors, yeah. those blue sensors, those are not all total units, are they? No, no, th these are, um, those are actually transmitters. Transmitters. Okay? The, the hierarchy from a data model perspective is school or station, transmitter, sensor. Okay, so technically and anything that has an antenna is a transmitter. Okay, and what we're seeing on that map are, are transmitters. I see. All right, so this transmitter has five different, you know, a number of different sensors attached to it. All right, so when I click on that transmitter, it shows me what sensors are attached. Oh, okay, and it shows me what those sensors, this is the name of the sensor, this is the property it measures, this is the units it measure, and this is the current reading. Okay, uh, does that make sense? Yes, okay. yes, thank you. Very good, excellent. Okay. Um, all right, so um, moving on, uh, so if I zoom back out, uh, and here, one thing I wanted to comment about this vegetable garden here, um, this school has, a, this innovative school in Leon County has a culinary program where they teach kids how to cook. And a lot of this food they use is actually grown in the school's vegetable garden, which uh, you know, we think is definitely pretty, pretty cool and progressive. All right, now just, um, all right, if I go to um, one of the things I did earlier today, I went to Child High School, and you'll notice there's a CO2 sensor and a noise detector, or sound detector, okay? Now it turns out, I, I sort of just did this for this demo because um, I, I, you know, we hadn't set up the psu.weatherstem.com slash coil site yet. So those readings are actually coming from these new sensors that we just started working with that can measure carbon dioxide concentration, noise, and decibel levels. So uh, that was actually something that um, uh, I was pretty proud that I, I brought the unopened boxes with me to State College Saturday night and got it all working within the hotel room at Nimi Lion Inn yesterday. So uh, that was, that was kind of fun. Um, all right. So um, now, any questions before I sort of continue on with some of this uh, demonstration? Very good, very good, all right. So, and and I, I have to interrupt you, I have one more. Yeah. So you were talking earlier about um, this is giving us real-time data. Yes. But the screen you showed us earlier actually had um, projections of yes. the screen. Yes. So where does that data come yep. from? We have a partnership w with a organization called Weather Underground, okay? And let me touch on that a little bit. So all of the data that has been like historical data and current data comes from these weather stem units, all right? All of the forecast data, as well as some of the other data like satellite data and radar data and some other data that we'll see comes from weather undergrounds, okay? And I'll talk a little bit about weather underground in a moment. There's some other data like weather balloon data that we display that comes from a, uh, a feed from, a, from the Unisys weather API. Uh, there's astronomical data, there's coastal data, and again, that, that gets into that concept we talked about earlier about assimilation, okay? But the forecast data comes from Weather Underground. Um, has anyone never heard, has everyone heard of Weather Underground? Yeah, they're a very uh, a popular site that was recently uh, um, acquired by the Weather Channel um, in Atlanta, right? Um, okay, so um, now, oh, just one other cool thing that I'll show. When I go down to this cloud camera, so we can click on these different cloud cameras and sort of see what the clouds are looking at like right now across the district. And what we've done here is we've actually positioned all the cameras so that they're all sort of pointing to the middle of Tallahassee. So we can see what the skies look like from the south, from the east, from the north, from the west. Okay, so now each time we add a, oh, each time we add one of these weather stations, each school automatically has its own weather station webpage. So I said, I'm logged in as an administrator, 
So I can just if I show you behind the scenes what we've built with WeatherStem is a weather station management software. So if I go to that school before that has the vegetable garden and the, the greenhouse, this is where their site administrators can go and configure like the network information. So this is basically, you know, helping the weather stem platform register, you know, where the network addresses relative to the internet these devices are going to be. And this is where we can lay out and specify specifically where down to the nearest square inch, where these different transmitters are. So that's why when I looked at that map, you saw those transmitters laid out geographically where they were. That's all established using the WeatherStem software application that an administrator or a site administrator would use. Okay? Um, so each one of these weather stations has their own weather station web page, which I'm going to just sort of show a little bit about now. So this is Chairs Elementary School. Uh, and this is what Larry was referring to earlier. This is the forecast data, which obviously comes from Weather Underground, right? And uh, you'll notice that um, this little icon here, what we do is as soon as, soon as one of these weather stem units is installed, um, a Weather Underground site automatically gets created, okay? So um, we're trying to, you know, th they like this because every time we add a new station, they get more data fed into their network, which helps them drive more localized weather forecast products. Right? Um, so we can go on here. I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of cool features on here. So um, at each of these schools, we can click here and see the current radar. And this, of course, also comes from Weather Underground. And the latest satellite picture. Okay, it's a pretty clear, sunny, hot day in Tallahassee, which is not unusual. All right, now one feature that I'm going to show that's pretty popular is um, so these cloud cameras that you see, as I said, um, as soon as we install one, they begin uploading data once a minute to WeatherStem. All right? So what we do is at the end of every day, every night at midnight, we create a sky video. All right? So this is actually the sky movie from overhead Chairs Elementary School yesterday. And as it's playing, I have to scroll down a little bit here. Um, it, my, my resolution on this screen is a little too high for this feature, but down below, it's actually playing a graph that lets you see what the weather was at each point in time during the day. Okay? So you can, you can really see a cause and effect interrelationship between, well, what was the weather and um, what was the, um, oops, uh, what was the weather and, you know, what did the sky look like overhead at that particular moment in time? Um, so, uh, and I can drag this playhead forward and backward to zero in on very specific points of the day. And if I pause this and then move my mouse over one of these different points and then click on it, it'll, it would actually open up and show me like what did the satellite look like at that time, what did the radar look like. So we, we think this is a really interesting way to help kids understand the interrelationship between the world around them, um, what it looks like the instruments that are collecting data from that world around them, and what the data says. All right? And uh, another thing we can do, I'll just sort of jump off to another page real quick, is um, this, we're not only limited to one camera per site. So this unit that I'm going to go to is next to a, you have 4-H in Pennsylvania? Okay. This unit is next to this 4-H camp in north central Florida, uh, Cherry Lake. And you can see here we have a probe that's measuring lake temperature. Okay. And um, we are not limited to having only one camera. So if I go to more and then to cameras, we have a camera that is fixed on the water level. Okay. So that's a live picture right now of the water level at this lake. So this line here represents the normal water level, which right now is about three inches below normal. And recently, we found a company in Britain that makes these low power underwater cameras. So I mean obviously that's kind of a, the, the lake, what was the temperature? The lake temperature right now is 88 degrees. So the, the lake is very, has, is very al has a lot of algae in it. So this is not the clearest picture. But um, when the water is cooler, you can actually see a lot of aquatic life under the lake in real time. And the way WeatherStem works is as soon as we attach a camera, uh, pointed in any direction, 
it automatically creates one of these time lapse movies. So this one I think is really neat because um, you know you can see I've noticed that it's like as soon as the wa as soon as the air temperature gets to about 90, the lake turns green. Okay, so you can really focus on some cause and effect type stuff there. And if I want to add other probes to it to that graph down there, I just click anemometer to add wind speed or barometer to add pressure, right? Uh, and I can stop it and enlarge that picture to blow it up. Okay, um, I'm still waiting to see an alligator here. Um, uh, haven't, I've seen them in person, but not, not yet on the camera yet. Okay. Um, another thing that I'm going to show that is, uh, I'm going to go back to the Leon School site. Um, so there are four curricular areas of focus with WeatherStem um, that we're focusing on. Um, weather and climate is our first and foremost priority. Then agriculture, because I told you before how STEM and WeatherStem is more like stem of a plant. Um, astronomy and marine science. Those are because over the next year, what we're really going to be focusing on is building curriculum and professional development that covers those four topical areas in a way where the activities can require teachers and students to go leverage this real data from their or other school sites. Um, inset within those two fundamental objectives of those four curricular areas are introducing students to, quote, big data and also computer programming, OK? Um, we believe that, and I've, I've mentioned this many times uh, in some conversations I've been having recently, but we believe that the, um, in the 90s, for instance, in the mid-90s, there was an explosion of job opportunities for young people, or any people, people of any age, that had web development competencies, that knew HTML, CSS, those sorts of um, technologies. We believe there's going to be an explosion in that field, or in, in the fields of analytics, and understanding big data. In, uh, by the year 2022, there are forecasted to be 150 billion internet connected devices, um, weather stations, phones, laptops, um, you know, ovens, microwave ovens, uh, stoves. So all of those manufacturers are going to be taking advantage of their network capabilities to assemble data and be able to deliver more real time customer service product enhancements, um, alert, uh, you know, notification of defects, et cetera. So a lot of these companies, no matter what their industry, are going to really be looking for people that understand those mechanics. So we want the students that are exposed to weather STEM to have some interesting activities that expose them to analytics at as early of an age as possible. So therefore, one of the things we've built in weather STEM already is these data mining tools. Right? So when I go to the data link up here, um, it will prompt me to select a station for data mining. All right? So then I will, on the drop down, it'll give me the list of all the stations installed in that domain. So let's suppose I go to Child's High School. So here it lists for me, well, these are all the sensors that are attached. Um, this is the name of the sensor. This is the property that it measures. This is the units of measurement. And this is the current reading uh, that's coming from that device. And you can see we've already got our CO2 sensor and our sound sensors attached here. So let's just suppose that I am a science teacher, and I'm going to introduce my students to the fascinating topic of radiative transfer. So I want my students to understand the interrelationships between humidity, which is measured by the hygrometer, um, temperature, which is measured by the thermometer, and solar radiation, which is measured by the solar radiation sensor. So then I'm going to have my students participate in an activity that's going to ask them to look at data from the temporal period of June 1st to June 30th. So I'm going to choose those dates on my date chooser. And I'm going to say output it in a simple comma delimited file in one minute intervals. So then I press submit. And within a matter of a couple seconds, here's this download link that I can click on. And boom. There is the data.csv file that when I open it up in the left-hand window here is automatically opening it up in Excel. Okay? And there is the um, record ID, the timestamp, the humidity, solar radiation, and temperature. Okay? And I'm ready to begin you know, analytics. Um, I can import that into a more sophisticated software application. Um, and like I said, what we're doing going forward is we're building a lot of activities. A, a lot of the 
STEM activities are going to introduce students to using that tool and using the data that's generated in a number of different activities and assessments. Then we can also, another thing we can do is we can look at it. Uh, so let, let's, let's do another example. Um, now let's suppose that I've just introduced, uh, now I'm at an elementary school. So I'm going to go to Gilchrist Elementary. And I've just taught maybe my third grade students about air pressure. And I've explained that, you know, the barometer goes down, the weather gets stormy. The barometer goes up, the weather gets nice. That's from a textbook, okay? Let's talk about how we can maybe relate that to the real world. So what we can do here is we can go get the barometer and the rain indicator that measures not only how much rain has fallen, but how hard it's falling. So I'm going to plot that for the same period of June in a chart, okay? So now when I click Submit, within a couple of seconds, there is that data feed, okay? And, and what you can notice is the, the blue spikes represent measured rainfall during that month of June. And what you'll see is, as you would expect, um, most of the spikes in rain rate occurred at barometric pressure minima, okay? Then further, we, as we move our mouse over these different data points, we can see exactly what the conditions were. And then if I click on one of those data points, let me just allow pop-ups here. Let me say always allow. When I click on this, this shows me what the skies look like at that time. Obviously, it was storming. This is what the radar looked like. Obviously, there was some convection in the area. That school is right just south of I-10. Um, there's the latest um, satellite picture. You can obviously see there was some convective activity overhead. And this is what the latest, does, does anyone in the audience uh, want to tell me what that diagram is? Any weather folks here? No? Very nice. Yep. Also known as a skew-t diagram. Okay. Are you meteorology? Okay. Oh, excellent. Oh, got you. Oh. Okay. Well, this is a, um, this is a, um, a, a skew-t diagram. And th this basically is a chart. This is a very important forecasting tool for meteorologists. Um, at 159 sites across the United States, we send weather balloons up twice a day. And those weather balloons are fixed with sensors. And those sensors broadcast via radio frequencies to a station on the ground that collects the data and helps create these charts. So the right-hand white line is temperature. The left-hand white line is dew point temperature. So I'll ask you, what do you think, when do you think it's more humid? When those lines are closer together or further apart? Dew point is the point when what forms? Dew point. Dew, yeah. So the dew point temperature, so the closer the dew point is to the temperature, the more humid it is. Okay? And when they are equal to each other, you have 100% relative humidity. And you'll eventually start condensing the water vapor in the air into particles. And then you have cloud droplets, and then eventually precipitation. So, un so looking at this chart, we can understand where the different layers of the atmosphere are more moist or more dry. And in layman's terms, drier air is heavier and denser than moist air. Okay, I won't get into the physics beyond uh, about that because that gets us into a much longer conversation. But if we know that we're going to have an area of dry air on top of an area of moist air, that dry air is going to sink, it's going to displace the moist air up, and we're going to get clouds and precipitation forming. Okay? So this is obviously a topic that would be more in an advanced type situation. But again, clearly, what we've been able to do here is we've been able to help with real data that came from the instruments outside these kids' classrooms. We've been able to establish the reality behind something that they've been spoon-fed from a textbook. And we think there's some, you know, some interesting opportunities there. Um, also, some other things that we can do is uh, if, if we're doing some sort of you know, real in-depth study like maybe we're looking at sort of an agricultural discussion and we want to talk about the interrelationship between, you know, how good is Susie doing or Johnny doing at keeping the water, at, at the, the plants moist? So let's look at the soil moisture probe and the um, rain rate and see if we can draw any correlations there. So when we plot this, this lets us look for, so the blue is the soil moisture and um, you know, interestingly, um, in so soil moisture is measured in a unit of electrical conductivity. 
So it's actually the reverse. So the the higher the number, the drier it is. Okay, because you know the at, at zero, that's strong electrical conductivity. So um, we can see that you know the the soil started very as you know you, we can see. Look, the soil was dry, and then all the, now in the, on this plot the rain rate is in gold. So as soon as we had an observed heavy rain spike, look what happened to the soil moisture. Okay, and it stayed pretty moist, and then there was another rain spike, and it got moist, it dried out a little bit, and then there was another moisture spike, and it got wet again. All right. So um, we, we think that with with creative curriculum writers and creative professional development writers, like we are just about to employ with the Weatherstone Project, there's an unlimited amount of different activities that can take this real world data and engage the students in a meaningful fashion here. All right. Um, okay. So um, any questions about uh, one, one other thing before I start taking questions. I'll, I'll just mention that some of the other statistical mechanics that you can do, obviously, you know, being that you can download this into a comma delimited spreadsheet, you could, pick, you could take this data and you know, do anything you want with it in an external system. But you can also, even within the front end of this, so if, if I wanted to just, for instance, look at high temperatures, daily high temperatures for the month of June, so I could click day maxima and chart. So now what this is going to do is this is going to show me a plot for June that just shows me the daily high temperatures. Okay. Um, so I have some latitude with respect to how I can manipulate the outputs. Um, I can also export to JSON. Anyone, everyone familiar with JSON? The JavaScript object notation. Uh, so I can export to a format that would be more friendly for incorporating into a web application. I could also, um, for instance, I can export to a table. So if I wanted to look at temperature and maybe uh, humidity and choose table, this will create for me more of like an online spreadsheet where I can just sort of sort through the columns in um, groups of, uh, you know, in, in rows and columns as I would be in like an Excel spreadsheet. All right. Um, any questions about this before I move on from the, the data mining? Do you see the value in this, uh, you know, introducing this? Our goal, like I said, we want to introduce this to kids at the youngest age possible. All right? So we have, you know, our curriculum writers that are going to be building activities here are going to be building things that send third graders into these data mining tools. We'll see how that goes. Um, I have a lot of confidence uh, in, in how we're going to be able to engage them. All right, so real quick, I, next I mentioned um, computer programming. Um, so, um, everyone here know what an API is? Does anyone not know what an API is? Okay, an application programming interface. So, WeatherStem has an API. So, that means that um, any of the data that's within a WeatherStem page can be connected to via an external process. So, what we're seeing is, is right now, even early on in this project, some of the schools that are using WeatherStem are teaching their kids how to build web pages. And the students, some of the activities, students have to connect to the WeatherStem API and have weather data from their weather station embedded into the web pages, as well as cloud camera images. So as a very, very simple example of this, I can go to a very simple web page here, home.ucompass.com slash test.html. Okay, and you see where it says current conditions at child's high, the current temperature is 90 and the pressure is 30.03, and it just changed. The wind speed is currently 8. If I view the source of this, I'm going to expose you guys to some HTML, but don't throw anything at me. Okay, so um, this is the HTML code that was written for this web page that you see here. And what we have is we've embedded a uh, standard JavaScript library called jQuery. Okay. Then we've embedded the WeatherStem API component. Okay. Then we have set the weather station scope for our web page to be a domain of stations called Leon Schools and a specific school called Childs. Then within our web page, we're going to see these tags like span data sensor equals thermometer. That tag will automatically be replaced with the actual current value from that weather stem, that weather stem units thermometer sensor, okay? Um, so in this documentation here from this uh, page, it, you know, it, it explains how that works, but you can also do more ex advanced things 
where it introduces students to some fundamental syntactic programming concepts like objects and arrays and JSON, which is, in, which is fast displacing XML as sort of the ubiquitous data transfer um, format for web applications and computer applications. We also walk the students through, you know, what some more sophisticated examples of, you know, making calls for historical data. Um, so if you wanted to write your own statistical data warehousing tool, you could do that. Um, and we have examples from different programming languages like um, C Sharp and Java and JSON, P, et cetera. Um, any questions about this? We also, one of the things we want, are, are planning to do um, in 2015 is uh, a couple things I'll mention is we're setting up a general scholarship fund where we're hoping, you know, the, the finances haven't been established yet, but we're hoping to set aside two full scholarships. One would be for the most creative application of using the WeatherStem API to build a web app, okay? Another would be uh, a, the, the most creative electronic design of a probe or sensor that could connect to the WeatherStem system. Okay, um, so no questions about the API? Okay, going behind the scenes. Um, so uh, again, as I mentioned, I showed you before how at one of these sites, if I went to uh, this Child's High School site, I made it think that we had an air quality station that is measuring CO2 and sound, which actually is coming from these devices right here. So. Um, what, what happens? Let, let's suppose we have a young man or woman that designs a probe that measures something like soil pH or um, some other property. How do we then quickly get it into incorporated into WeatherStem? And why would we want to do that? Well, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the philosophy of where we think things are going. I think what you're going to see in classrooms going forward over the next five years is you'll see teachers saying, all right, class, get your probes out. Okay, and you're going to see a whole new generation of science education devices. I saw this last week when I was at the ISTE conference, the International Society for Technology and Education, where I met, hey, nice to see you. I met Dr. Pop there. Um, I saw, maybe you saw too, uh, an emerging generation of like probes that are going to be affordable and easily accessible in the classroom. So I think you're going to see teachers incorporating probes that connect to mobile devices that gather the data, and you're going to need that data to go somewhere. You know, probeware is what it's sort of being referred to, and we want WeatherStem to be a place where you can dump that data. So as an administrator, we can go behind the scenes to science settings, and we can teach the system what properties that it wants to recognize. So when I added that CO2 sensor, I created a property called concentration. Okay, I just went down to add property and said add property. Then I went and created a unit of measurement called parts per million okay, that I bound to the concentration property. And I specified what kind of data it's going to be housed in from a database perspective. Then I went and created a sensor type called CO2 sensor that measures things in parts per million and is bound to a net atmo as the manufacturer of the devices that are you were using for our CO2 sensor. And then basically what I do you know behind the scenes is I sort of then teach WeatherStem how to easily connect to that data and incorporate it into the WeatherStem platform. So um, you know our goal is to set it up so that WeatherStem can be very extensible and that as the science education landscape evolves, to require more and more things to be measured, light, different gas concentrations, um, different variables, we'll be able to very quickly respond and extend the system to incorporate them and to you know, add them to all the different features that you're seeing here. Okay? Um, so um, the next thing I'm going to show, if, any questions about that? Stop me at any time. We have, yes, sir, Dr. Pop. Um, right now, this system right now, I've got locked down to the, so you can see where I'm logged in as an administrator. There are different hierarchical, hierarchical levels of administration. So right now, super user is like me, for all intents and purposes right now, me and a couple of my team members. So that right now is a super user setting. 
but we're hope what we're we're hoping to do is make it so that as the rate of which teachers would get their hands on new probes, they would be empowered to, to know how to do that themselves. Because right now there, you know, there, there's more than just front end. Like I had to actually to do this, I had to actually go and in the back end teach WeatherStem how to connect to the service that so these devices here, what happens is, is these transmit to this little device I have here. Okay? And then these devices upload to a service provided by the manufacturer of these things, which is called NetAtmo. Then I'm actually connecting to their API based on properties established on the front end. And then that gets incorporated into the WeatherStem data pickup scheme. Okay? So the vision would be is that as time goes by and we see more you know, sensible integration standards materializing, you know, someone would be able to incorporate their own probe and sensor into WeatherStem and wouldn't have to involve us at all. So that, that's sort of the vision. Okay? And furthermore, we want to see our company develop more technological capabilities so that people that understood basic electronics and resistors and transmitters would be able to build their own sensors and transmit to our receiver for then automatic uploading into our system. That, that's really where we hope to be going over the next five years. Right, very good question. Any other questions? I have a question. My, mine has to do with um, sort of being a homeowner. And as you know, I'm interested in the, in the gardening and, and such. It's unlikely that I'm going to have a unit like this. And I sure. may not need a unit like this in my garden. But I might be interested in the soil, the PA, soil moisture, pH, temperature, some basic things. How far away are we today from co commercially available cost effective models that can tap into my computer and give me those kind of reads on an ongoing basis? Is that here? Or? I, I think we're, we're getting very close. Uh, for instance, um, at Costco, uh, the big shopping center at Costco back over Christmas, they were marketing these kits that had, you know, a lot of the variables that we're looking at here. Um, they, they didn't have solar. They had like wind, temperature, rainfall, um, humidity, pressure um, for $79. Okay, and they had a component that would enable those devices to be received and then connected to your home network, and then they were uploaded to some cloud-based service. And I think that they were probably, you know, targeting, you know, weather geeks like me, you know, as Christmas presents for their, you know, spouses. Uh, so we're we're getting closer. And and these devices here, just to share with these these Net Atmo, technically these, you know, you could make these into wearable weather stations because you could connect the device to your mobile phone uh, hotspot and put one, you know, keep that in your pocket. And you know, put this in another pocket, and this is transmitting to that. That's transmitting to your smartphone. That's uploading to the internet. And these are like I think $159 for these devices. Um, and and there's on on Kickstarter. Okay, are you all familiar with the site Kickstarter? Um, there, I'll just bring up uh, to give these guys maybe a little bit of promotion. Uh, it's called BloomSky.com. All right, this is a project on Kickstarter that is a um, a unit that's like a very portable, low power unit that has, you know, a sky camera and also um, some other, you know, weather station type stuff. And I, I think they said that their starting price was going to be $159. Um, so I, I, I think that, um, and, and then, you know, at some of these trade shows, we, we met this company in Korea that is opening up a factory in Indonesia where they want to mass produce low cost. Um, weather stations for home and business usage. So I, I suspect that we are rapidly accelerating toward a time when these sorts of setups that measure everything I've shown here can be available at a relatively low cost to the average homeowner. And, and I think that um, I, I've heard um, there's some ambitious projects, and I don't have any confirmation, but I've heard, for instance, uh, you know, Tesla, the mm -hmm. Indian car maker, they're looking to try to set up a really, really broad coverage in India of these portable weather stations because they want to have in automobile weather. They want to be able to tell you that you know when you make a right turn, it's going to start raining 500 feet afterwards. So the more localized stations that there are, 
the richer the analytics are to drive those very high resolution, precise forecast models. Right. So I, I think, and you know, that's why like our focus, one, one of our challenges as, as we've been introducing weather stem at some of these trade shows is people come and they see the equipment and they sort of maybe think that that's our focus. You know, our focus is more on, you know, what can we do in a educationally meaningful fashion by collecting this data and then doing interesting and creative things with it. Um, so um, I, I will give a plug to the manufacturer of these instruments, Davis Instruments. Um, they, they, they're very, very reliable. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, the biggest maintenance headache has been cleaning the bird droppings out. Very, very good question. Okay, I can tell you, that, um, I'll, I'll share with you in, in full disclosure, um, we are a reseller for Davis Instruments. So we're able to buy stuff from them at 40%. Okay, so our ISS um, unit costs us $939. And this mounting tripod is like um, 45 minus 20%, right? Or 40%, okay. And then these agricultural stations that measure soil moisture, soil temperature, are about 180. Um, the, the device that lets you connect one of these to the internet is about 140. So the, a, a full unit um, is costs us, uh, and then the cloud camera is about 250. So the whole unit ends up costing us about $1,400 per school. And we're trying to find creative ways to get that cost down. For us, if we could, we, you know, giving away the instruments is what we'd like to do. We'd like to find ways to maybe commercialize some of the innovative digital software that takes the data and does meaningful things from a curricular point of view. So that's that's about what the, the cost is. And, and the, these units themselves, like if, if you went to Davis, um, th there's a lot of companies that make these sorts of weather stations. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is like the higher end model from Davis. This device here that you see here, this is a solar powered fan. So what this does is it like constantly, when the sun is on it, circulates air so that you're not getting artificially elevated temperature readings. This is a fan aspirated radiation shield. All right. So um, again, you know, we're we're trying to find creative ways to, um, you know, investigate new technologies. Like I said, this this device here now is able to measure barometer, humidity, pressure, concentration of carbon dioxide, noise. Uh, has network capabilities, and it's 150 dollars. So uh, we're going to be constantly you know, evaluating the landscape and, and expecting, especially with 3D printing, to see the cost of these things go down. But you got to start somewhere. Sure. You know. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, Kyle? So I went to your learn link and okay. curious about the kinds of learning experiences that are there. I couldn't get in because probably after I did it at one of your Florida school sites or yes. whatever. But can you explain to us the learning materials you have? Well, right now, um, and, and just in, in full disclosure, we're early on in that process. Okay, so we've, we've been more focused on building some of the, the infrastructure. Um, we just recently hired a full-time curriculum writer. And so our goal is to be, by this time next year, to have a full, robust repository of standard-aligned curriculum and professional development resources. Um, so we're, we're, just, um, we're just sort of getting out of the gate. And we actually had thought about, well, should we delay getting out and really talking about WeatherStem until we have that robust repository? And if we would have made that unfortunate mistake, there would be so many ideas that we wouldn't have picked up during the past, you know, several months where we've been talking about this. And I'll, I'll tell you when we, when we get um, a little further on in my presentation shortly, uh, I'll tell you about what the WeatherStem package is which is, you know, something, our, our plan is, is to market this to schools, and they'll have a number of different components. And when you click on that learn component, you'll actually be going to our LMS that your school will get to, you know, as a software program to teach their other courses that will also have curriculum built into it. Okay, so very good question. And uh, sorry for your frustration there by clicking on that and not seeing anything, because uh, we, we do got to get some stuff up there. That's the, yeah, that's, 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 that's the goal. First of all, all the data, like everything that I'm showing you, the, the philosophy is, is everything is open source. Um, and we want to encourage people in one part of the world to come and, you know, analyze data from another part of the world. 
as far as the learning activities and resources, our goal is for them to be open source as well. I think that if, if, if we did our jobs right, you would be able to take those open source learning resources and package them into a credit-based course. And if an institution was offering that, well then, you know, that would be business arrangements between a student and the credit granting institution. But that's, that's a project to figure out down the road. Um, all right. Um, any other questions? Brad? Oh, you were holding your hand up. I didn't see that. <laughs> I, I, have a, I, have a, uh, I have a feature for Larry now. Okay. This is a, um, you know, get, continuing with that theme of um, schools that are, are, you know, integrating agriculture. So let's suppose we went to the Penn State, I'll go back to the tsu.weatherstem.com slash coil site. And I'm actually going to go in, I'm going to go in as an administrator real quick here. Uh, so just let me go in as the domains and uh, Pennsylvania State administer domain. So I'm going in as a back end administrator here. So I'll go to the Penn State Coil Weather Station. And I'm going to go to the gardens link. Okay. So now I'm going to click add a garden. And um, this, I'll call this uh, kid flower garden. Okay. And I'll say that it is a type of garden, a flower garden. Now, this shows me a map of the local area. Okay, so um, I think that the so this is like the Penn State campus. So the arboretum is well, let's just suppose it's over here somewhere. Okay, okay. All right. So I can zoom in on it, and now I'm going to draw a polygon. Okay, that establishes the perimeter of that garden. Okay. And notice that as I create the polygon, it um, updates the area of that in real time. Okay, so I can change that around. All right. So now that I've created my garden, and that's obviously a pretty ambitious sized garden, I press submit. Now when I click on this, now this gives me a plant finder. Right. So we've tapped into this extensive database from the National Gardening Association. And we're also tapping into another one that's going to have even more data. So let's suppose that Larry is going to add um, some roses to his garden. So search for rose. And then over here on the right, you see this extensive list of all of these different species. Okay. So now I'm going to click on these, these nice looking blue flowers. So when I click on it, it shows me all this rich information about you know, what um, genus and species, common names, um, WeatherStem automatically figures out what state my site is in and shows me the hardy map for that state. Right? Um, it determines um, what the horizontal spread, the vertical growth, sun requirements, moisture requirements, growth rate, salt tolerance, and all these other parameters that we're working on building a key for, such as um, you know, its shape, leaf color, bloom color, what time of year it blooms. And then I can add this to the garden. Okay, so I've just added this plant to the garden, and then I can uh, call these, can rename them. So I'll call them Reagan Roses. All right. And now when I go to that weather station and click on more and click on gardens, there is the kid flower garden. There's the square meterage. I click on that, and that lets the public see what the, you know, where the garden is. Okay, and what kind of plants are in it, okay, and all this other rich information. But when you think about all this data that we have here, when you think about, you know, we have a, at these sites we have a weather station, so we know how much rain it's gotten, we know the sun it's, it's been getting, um, we know the temperature, we know down to the nearest square inch where the growing area is, we know the conditions of the growing area as far as the soil moisture, soil temperature. Um, we know what kind of plants are there, and we have all this metadata that helps us understand how those plants are going to behave or possibly fail. So again, you know, with a creative curriculum writer, we hope to see a lot of really interesting ideas and activities being born from this particular uh, um, process. Now, one of the things we're doing in, um, also in Florida, um, our partners, uh, our, our pilot partners, Leon County Schools, um, there, you know, I, I, it wouldn't be appropriate to say it's a city, but it's more urban. We are going to be partnering with a school district in rural Florida called Madison County, which is about an hour east of Tallahassee. 
And what we're doing there next week, right? Yeah. We are installing 10 weather STEM units at five public schools across this county and on five farms. So we've actually partnered with the local Florida Farm Bureau and we're going to bring bringing weather STEM units to a watermelon farm, uh, some hay farms, some row crop farms. And the vision is, if it works out, is we will have made progress on our curriculum and professional development so that the kids can hopefully teach the farmers STEM, okay, like technology, some of the things they're being exposed to in their curriculum, and the farmers can hopefully teach the kids real-world hands-on agriculture. So it's a story that remains to be written, but we're going to be jumping into it with both feet next week, the 16th, 17th, and 18th. Uh, I've, I've you know, asked Ms. Davis to have it scripted down to a, the nearest minute. Um, so that, you know, because it's a big county and we got to do 10 of these in three days. So it should be, should be pretty interesting. Um, but but I'm, I, we're, we're really excited about that because we think that that's just going to open up uh, our knowledge. Every time we've gone out to meet with these farmers, we learn a ton of things about what they would benefit from having measured. And um, so I, we're really excited about it. Hey, Ed, I'm, I'm watching our time here yes. and we're drawing to a close. But okay. Let, let me just... Um, you know, one of the things that has gotten me very interested in this kind of work over the last three to five years is the idea of citizenship research, citizen research, I guess they call it, where I collect data on, you know, whatever, my the birds in my backyard or, or whatever, and, and then we begin to feed that information into a, into a source like this. And, and it seems to me that you're really, this project is addressing two issues, so correct me if I'm wrong. One is it's helping students and in the case of what you're just talking about with the with the watermelon growers our, our populations understand science and technology and in, in the environment but the other thing you're doing is you're helping students become literate with data yes which is and you mentioned to me a, an interesting thought is last evening is should we be teaching students you know arcane formulas of of math concepts that they probably, or should we be teaching them how do you deal and manage and understand and manipulate data? Because that's the world we, we live in. Oh, absolutely. And that is definitely uh, through creative curricular activities. That's really what we want to have this about. In other words, we don't just want to throw kids here and say, figure it out. We want to give them a framework to work with that requires them to go and get the data and then have to answer questions that require them to do things with the data that are going to require critical thinking, and it's going to require them to be exposed to numerical techniques that are going to be part of those job requirements we talked about earlier in, in the discussion. So yeah, I'm, that, that is absolutely what we want to have um, as a byproduct of this. And, and like I said, we're still just up front. We are at the, um, we're very excited about how fast we're moving on this project, because like I said, this was just a, you know, a crazy idea uh, a year ago, and then we really started it about seven, eight months ago. So we're, we're excited to see what can happen, you know, over the next year. Well, we'd like to follow that story with you. So would you join me in welcoming and thanking Ed for sharing this amazing stuff? It, my mind is like going a million miles. Uh, thank you as well uh, from Penn State for the, uh, for the weather stem uh, unit. We're really excited about that. And uh, Hopefully we'll get you here back in a year yeah, or so and that, hear that the story. That, so. that would be great. And Thank you, um, that's uh, my contact info. Let me just fast forward so you can see my contact okay. information. I had had a lot of these slides in case our internet didn't work. Right, right. So I'm just going to put uh, our uh, slides up that show the contact information and you can reach out to me uh, with any questions. And um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ed.